Deal. Uh, so we're here uh, in this room today to talk about uh, running server-side JavaScript with Nashorn. Uh, Nashorn is the correct pronunciation of the word. Um, uh, Nashorn is is uh, Java's uh, um, JavaScript engine, and um, we'll go into some details on that. So some quick links uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me, if you want to learn more about me, etc. I uh, do some writing for for InfoQ. Uh, if if anybody is interested in uh, doing writing about enterprise um, JavaScript or uh, or even Java or whatever enterprise anything. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I can get you in touch with the right people at InfoQ. Uh, it really is a, a, a great uh, group of people to be associated with. There's a lot of really good material and, and uh, access to experts in, in just about every, every vertical of enterprise development. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, I'm on GitHub. All my code from this presentation, past presentations, uh, current work, uh, past work uh, is, is up on there. Uh, so you can you can get me on there. I'm basically a damn developer everywhere except for Gmail. You guys can email me directly at danielpwoods at gmail.com if you have any questions, etc. Um, and uh, if you guys are not already following me on Twitter, uh, you're probably doing Twitter wrong. Uh, so make sure that you get me. I'm Dan Developer on there, and that's what my profile picture looks like. So today we might change later. So. I, I want to um, I want to give you guys just a little bit of background on um, why am I why am I even remotely qualified to, to talk about this thing uh, and and specifically at a JavaScript conference why would I want to talk about Java stuff um, so a, a few years ago a number of years ago I uh, wrote a web application a web service um, called Photo Zero and uh, it was a really great idea at the time it was pretty pretty revolutionary. Um, and like all great ideas in our world, it was a photo sharing site. Um, it was a little bit different though, uh, in that basically the concept behind it and, and the real value proposition of, of the application and the service is that it used uh, client-side cryptography to encrypt a photo prior to it being uploaded uh, to the server, and uh, the same cryptographic libraries were used for unlocking it. Uh, later, so you could share. You would get a short link. Uh, you could share that with your friends. They would type in a password that you had written on a napkin and hand it off to them. And uh, and that that was the that was more or less the idea behind it. Uh, it was very. It's very. Uh, it was, I should say, it was very um, client side JavaScript heavy. Uh, I I would say it was early days for uh, JavaScript uh, uh, frameworks, MVC frameworks. Um, so it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of there was a lot of jQuery going into it, and um, it was it was making use of some of the newer HTML5 APIs um, for getting at some of that stuff. Um, there, there's nothing in in particular. There's nothing really that novel about cryptography and JavaScript. There are plenty of libraries out there for doing this kind of thing, and I was making use of them. I didn't write the libraries myself. I'm not that smart, um, but the uh, the thing, the thing about it is that uh, doing this kind of thing in browser and from within JavaScript was extremely slow and painful. Um, so there, there was a lot of there was a lot of work. Uh, one one of the things to understand, I, I guess, about browsers uh, and and JavaScript within browsers, and you guys probably already know this, is that there's an execution time limit. Uh, for running some code. So if, if some operation that you're running, or some function that you're running exceeds this uh, prescribed time limit, uh, the, the browser will just kill it. And, and um, uh, the, it, it dies gracefully. There's not really a great way to detect that, that something has happened. So what I was finding was that photos that were you know, 50 to 100K were fine. Um, when you started to get into photos of real size, um, the uh, the browsers were just killing the processes that that were uh, that, that was handling the encryption and decryption part of it, and it was largely dependent upon hardware too. So I built a lot of code to make cryptography performant, and um, here's a slide with the general architecture of what uh, Photo Zero's uh, core infrastructure I would say looks like. Um, I uh, basically built into the application a chunking engine that would use HTML5's 
uh, file APIs to uh, slice the, the photo at certain fixed widths that I knew were able to be processed. And, um, and then uh, use, I, I would uh, uh, individually encrypt or decrypt those chunks uh, and then uh, set, either send them off to the server or recompose them on the client accordingly. Uh, it made it it made it faster, but being still a serial process, it wasn't fast enough. So I had to I had to build some uh, some uh, uh, code around uh, doing that processing asynchronously. And JavaScript doesn't have threads. I don't know if you guys know this or not. <laughs> but JavaScript doesn't have threads, and that kind of sucks, uh, especially when you need to do something that's real. Um, so. What I did was I uh, wrote a library, and there's a link to it at the bottom. Uh, it's a uh, it's a plugin for jQuery, uh, the background queue execution plugin, and uh, basically what that does is, in order to make these pro this processing asynchronous, it, it more or less emulates uh, scheduling um, by threads threading, I guess you would say, uh, within the browser by writing an iframe to the DOM injecting JavaScript into the iframe and the data that it needed. So in this case, it was base64 encoded data. And then it would run the encryption sequence within those, within those iframes. So effectively, from within the main application, you would schedule it. You would schedule some processing to happen. It maintained a queue of, of, uh, of workers that were, that were just iframes within the DOM. And then it would, it would go off and do this work. Uh, and then when it was done, it would return out of it. It would have a little notification hook, and then it would go off and, and do the rest of its processing. So that is more or less the way that that, that aspect of it worked. What I quickly pretty much realized, and, and the chunking part of it was really the first start of this, was that, um, was that this, this thing had uh, needed needed to basically be libraryified, right? So I needed to, I needed to have these things broken out so that, uh, so that the uh, the features of the application could be composed, right? And and JavaScript actually does that pretty well. But what I also noticed is that I was doing a lot of duplicate work from between the front end and the back end. So replicating models. So on the front end, I had a model object representing a photo, right? And the chunks that corresponded to the photo, and it had some some methods for recomposing that data, encrypting, decrypting, etc. Um, on the server side, I had uh, the, the, the server application was actually fairly simple, but it had a, a similar model, and it was implemented with Grails uh, running on the JVM. JVM is the space I'm most comfortable with. Uh, I, I would say uh, yeah. I'm second most comfortable with JavaScript, uh, and that is way less than Java. Um, so the, uh, the server side was implemented with Grails. Uh, it, it felt really weird to have this sort of uh, dual presence of, of Java on the back end and JavaScript on the front end. I thought, you know, at the time I was, I, was, uh, I was getting very comfortable with JavaScript. I was becoming more and more proficient every day. And it felt like, hey, why don't I just write this stuff in JavaScript on the, on, on the server as well? That would be really easy. But these were um, super early days for Node. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it, at the time, it wasn't really clear what JavaScript's role on the server side was going to be. Uh, primarily, JavaScript has been an in-browser language, and um, it's, it's turned into something so much more than that now. And at the time, it, it, it wasn't really clear what, what that was all about. So um, in addition to that, my hosting provider had really great Java infrastructure. And, uh, and had nothing for JavaScript. So it was an easy decision to, to stick with the JVM. But I knew that the JVM could run JavaScript code um, because, uh, because it has that capability within it. So I decided to look into that and to see if I could um, build these libraries and, and, and take uh, the, these model objects, for example, and uh, just have one library of the model that was represented both on the server side and uh, in the client side. And so I got really deep into this, and I, I, I started looking into Rhino. Rhino is the original execution engine on the JVM for JavaScript. And Rhino was introduced in 1997. Uh, it was started by Netscape Navigator, uh, sorry, Netscape, and with, with the idea that uh, they were going to have a browser-like implementation, sort of like a web view uh, in Java for applets, and they were going to call it Javagator. <laughs> Um, 
Uh, back in 97, the idea of JavaScript was something that web pages, uh, th the idea of JavaScript at the time was basically that, that web pages would make your mouse look funny, right? And, uh, and that was basically what it was doing, or you know, old, old MySpace-like uh, MySpace pages. Um, it, had a, it, had, it, it worked basically on code generation, it had tons of memory leaks, uh, it was really slow, it, it had a very low ECMAScript compliance, uh, just really not a great solution it, is what I found right away. Um, but back in the early 2000s, basically what, what has enabled modern Rhino to continue to live and exist is that back in the early 2000s, Java got official uh, design specs for scripting languages. This is J, JSR 223, I think. Um, and, uh, and that basically opened the door for these dynamic languages to exist on the JVM. And it changed the JVM, I think. That, it kind of brought the JVM into the more modern era, where instead of just being a, a, a facility where Java could run, now the JVM is a platform where many languages can run. And, and that's, uh, that's what the modern JVM is really all about. And uh, um, as more or less JavaScript started moving toward uh, being important for server-side development, uh, I think that it became pretty clear pretty quickly that Rhino wasn't going to cut it anymore. And so that's where Nashorn comes in. Uh, so Nashorn is effectively a better than Rhino <laughs> uh, JavaScript engine. Uh, for the JVM, uh, it comes out of the box with Java 8 and above, um, and it, it's a it's a full replacement for Rhino. Now there still is compatibility um, with with Rhino through uh, ECMAScript extensions, so it's able to maintain that uh, that backward compatibility that that uh, that Rhino had with uh, with some of the special stuff that um, that Rhino introduced to JavaScript or exposed through JavaScript. And so the need the need for Nashorn uh, was very real around this time. And uh, basically, with the with the idea of the JVM being a, becoming a polyglot platform, um, that's more or less what Nashorn wanted to uh, wanted to leverage. Um, a lot of people do continue to think of, of the JVM, and they th they they only think of Java, but but it 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 doesn't have to be that way. And I think I think today, more or less, with Scala and with uh, with Groovy and uh, and and hopefully with JavaScript uh, more increasingly, uh, it'll be understood that the JVM bytecode is the power, right? That's, that's the powerhouse. That's where everything is. Uh, statically compiled, it's cross-platform, widely supported. Of course, there's two decades of development on, on JVM bytecode. Uh, that makes it great. Nashorn, uh, in its own respect, is geared toward uh, performance and, and ECMAScript compliance. So compliance making uh, making sure that we're following the design decisions, or that Nazarene is following the design decisions that, that uh, JavaScript was was meant for. Um, with with Rhino, it, it was almost that JavaScript was just a novelty, and and really that's kind of what it was uh, at the time. Um, Nashorn brings infrastructure for dynamic languages, and JavaScript is the first implementation of that, so it's very cool. Um, so. Nashorn, though, wasn't possible uh, on the JVM until, until Java 7. Java is a statically compiled language, um, and its ability in the past to run dynamic languages kind of resulted in these like really super costly workarounds. So uh, Groovy, for example, I, when, when Groovy was first coming about, its performance numbers were, were just extremely low. Um, because getting these, getting these uh, I'm sorry, compared to uh, compared to native Java. And that's because uh, building in these workarounds to make dynamic languages work, there wasn't anything in place at the JVM level, really, to make that happen. Uh, Java 7 uh, released in 2011, and it came, Java 7 is probably the most undervalued or underrated release of the JVM ever. Uh, and a big part of that is that it came with this inv invoke dynamic bytecode instruction that basically allows Java to continue to be statically linked and then to say at method invocation time that it's going to delegate the, the processing of, of that off to, uh, off to whatever implementation uh, that, that the language chooses to, um, chooses to use. So that, that basically means that the JVM incurs no overhead for running the dynamic language. And the performance of the dynamic language at this point is now uh, up to the implementers. That's, that's a really big deal because prior to this, it, it had been that, uh, that the JVM was the bottleneck. And now it's not that, that, that's not the case. Um, 
the the other part to this is that invoke dynamic uh, having that having that ability to uh, basically specify the, the the mechanism by which your uh, method dispatching is going to work from within your language uh, th through invoke dynamic it it gives nashorn and other languages the ability to uh, expose a, this this just super powerful meta object protocol and within um, within nashorn it is what is uh, being being used to uh, to leverage really tight Java to JavaScript and vice versa integration, so that's a pretty pretty cool thing. And we'll uh, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. And we'll look at that. So some features of the engine. It's 100 percent ECMAScript 5.1 compliant. Uh, as far as I know, when it did become ECMAScript 100 percent ECMAScript compliant, it was the only engine that was 100 percent compliant. Uh, I think that's changed a lot in the last year to two years or so. Uh, V8, as far as I know, is is currently 100% ECMAScript compliant. Um, it, in in addition to that ECMAScript compliance, it also has support for for a few extensions. Mozilla's uh, ECMAScript 1.8 1, 1 extensions uh, for uh, function expression closures. Uh, Mozilla 1.6 extensions for for each, so you can do for each style loops. Um, um, it's I, I think just syntax sugar mostly. Uh, and then uh, this backward compatibility for Rhino. So Rhino brought uh, some Java-style constructor arguments, um, <laughs> which uh, which have been preserved <laughs> for uh, for for that going forward. Now, in addition to all of this, like this is really cool stuff. Uh, and this, uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about how this can be leveraged for embedding <coughs> JavaScript systems. Um, but in addition to that, Java 8 also ships with this command line scripting. Uh, um, Utility, so you can run you can run uh, JavaScript scripts from the command line for system administrative purposes. Now that's a pretty cool thing. Um, let's let's go in real quick. Uh, talk a little bit about Avatar uh, in in addition to server side scripting. So JavaScript, as we've already mentioned and understand, is not just a toy, right? Uh, anymore, it's grown up a lot. Node has really kind of brought it to the next level. Node.js has been awesome. Um, the the really super smart dudes over at Oracle have taken Node and they have implemented it uh, through this project Avatar, and uh, they've built a Node.jar that is all of the faculties of Node. It supports all the Node, common JS require syntax stuff like that. Um, it was basically I think that Avatar itself was originally designed to showcase a lot of the features of uh, both Nashorn and Java E seven. Java E7 kind of brought a lot to the, the table as far as enterprise Java was concerned. Uh, um, Built-in web servers, uh, um, SSE service and events support, uh, web sockets, just a whole ton of, of streaming and stuff like that. One cool thing about um, Avatar and Node.jar is that it respects your Node module paths. So you don't have to do anything special to make this work. You just basically need to uh, have the, the Node modules within the uh, context of, of where your application is running, and it'll it'll pick them up. Everything works exactly as you would expect it to with Node, with regular JavaScript development. You can take the same code that you're running today in V8, and you can run it in Nashorn directly, and that's a um, that's a pretty cool uh, proposition. Now that said, some of the extensions to both both of the engines, uh, in in particular V8, some of its extensions are utilized heavily by by um, uh, some of the libraries that. That are that are out there, and one of them in particular is this is this error class, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> V8 and Nashorn have different ideas about what the error class does. Uh, so one of the things that this error class is capable of doing is capturing a stack trace, and some libraries utilize that to um, to get an idea of what you're trying to do, so they so that they can make some decisions. Uh, it's a weird thing, uh, but I've tracked it down. I built a fix for it. Uh, I'll show I'll show you guys the fix. I'm hoping that I can kick this back to um, to the Nashorn guys and uh, and and get them to uh, either bring it in or maybe have the uh, Nashorn representation of the error class more in line with V8s. Even though I'm not sure that either one is right or wrong. So I want to do a demo for you guys real quick. I want to show you guys um, running in. Uh, Java. So I have my repository here. My repository has some commits. Uh, basically, all of the demos that I'll be doing will correspond. You guys aren't seeing anything. <laughs> so I have a repository here. 
uh, repository has some commits. All the demos that I'll be doing will correspond to a specific hash um, within the uh, within the repository, and I'll uh, I'll tweet out links to this. So if you guys aren't following me on Twitter, you're you're wrong. All right. So we'll bring this in, and uh, what I want to show you guys here is. Just this very simple app, right? Uh, okay, so this is just a Node.js app, and and all that this is doing is it's uh, taking and uh, creating a web server. It's uh, it's binding a, uh, a request handler to it uh, on the default on the default path, and it's just going to write out uh, a simple hello world. It's going to listen on on uh, on port eight thousand. If we were to take this with Node, and we just said when we just started it, we would see that uh, that this thing starts up. Uh, if I curl localhost 8000, you can see we get the hello world. So this is running within Node right now. I can take this exact same application and come over to uh, come over to my project. Just gotta regenerate the um, idea files. Okay, and I'll drag that over. This is very high resolution here, so. That didn't work. Okay. Uh, so I, I built a project structure here. Um, I, I have uh, put together a little bit of work into uh, uh, building, uh, creating a, a build script, a Gradle build script uh, that uh, just puts the dependencies that we need. The, the Oracle dependency on the class path for Avatar. Uh, Avatar JS is in Maven Central, so you can just bring it into your project appropriately. Uh, I, I brought this one in, but that was an error, so uh, I'll make a note of that, that that's wrong. Now, uh, Node.js makes use of something called LibUniversal to get down to the native level to um, uh, basically all of its system calls are through, through LibUV. Uh, NAS, uh, sorry, um, uh, Avatar also has its own version of LibUniversal that's, uh, that comes as, as part of a nat native driver. So this artifact here, Lib Avatar JS. Um, this, this one indicates Mac OS. There's also one for Linux. Uh, so you get a dilib or you get an SO, a shared object according to uh, whatever your architecture is. Um, but basically, uh, we have our uh, Node app as, as we would expect here. And what I've done here is I've created a main class. And what this main class does is it does a little bit of hackery around the, um, around the class loader to uh, to get it to load our um, to get it to load our, our shared object so that we can uh, so that we have all the stuff that we need in place uh, so that uh, node.jar can make use of libuniversal from its from its driver um, but besides that all that I'm doing is I'm making use of, of this uh, common Oracle avatar JS server which is the node uh, effectively the node command and I'm, I'm giving it the path to our uh, app JS and this is just a runnable class. And if I debug this, I see it's firing up. And we have our server running pretty quickly, too. And if I curl, we get hello world, right? So now this is JavaScript running entirely within the JVM. It's a node app running entirely within the JVM, uh, making use of all, all, of, the, all of that stuff that, uh, that we like. And, and love about it. And this is great. So this is pretty cool. This, this gets us a long way. It really does. Um, now, another thing that I want to show you guys is, uh, so Node, Node is a cool start. Express is much cooler, right? Uh, and that's, that's kind of where we need to uh, be a little bit smarter, I think. And what's the advantage? Sorry? What's the advantage of running? Sure. Uh, so the, the question was, what's the advantage? Uh, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit. If, if 
if by the end I haven't covered that, just ping me about it, and and uh, I'll I'll be a little bit more explicit about it. So let me just jump back. So I have demo number two is my Express app. So now I have a legit uh, source main JavaScript. So now I have a uh, legit Express app. Whoops. And uh, and I have my, my application, which will fire up the Express application. I have some root routes. I have some uh, some views. I'm using Jade, right? Like everybody uses Jade, or I found out last night not everyone does. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, the project structure looks exactly like that, exactly like what you would expect to see inside of um, inside of a regular Express app. Uh, and so, what we need to do inside of this thing now is we need to come into here and say uh, main JavaScript. So we need to come into here and uh, sorry, just double check this thing. What I need to do is uh, npm install express to get it to go. Um, if you guys saw Ryan's talk earlier, you would see about uh, having a package JSON for, for npm and all the things. But we can just do an npm install express. This is a very simple express app, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And once we do that, we get our, our node modules express. And like I said, uh, avatar and node.jar are going to make use of, of uh, the, the node module pass. So the application's fired up, and uh, we can see that uh, when when it started, I've you know just printed out this listening on three thousand. If we come to a browser, uh, I cannot find module Jade. Okay, so I'll install Jade as well, Sorry. and I'll restart. So the first request that you make is going to do some inlining um, of, of the application. And uh, basically, all that, all that I've done here is just a, a simple demonstration. Uh, I believe that we actually have some text on here. Yeah, welcome to NASA. So whatever, the screen resolution is really good here. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is rendering our, our uh, Jade layout. It's, it's printing this stuff off. Uh, I included some Angular for fun, but I didn't actually make it an Angular app at all. Um, and uh, I, again, totally, totally running from within the JVM. And that's, that's what Avatar is all about. So this is a pretty cool thing for, uh, for Nashorn and for, uh, uh, for uh, the JVM with respect to JavaScript. Because Node is such a big ecosystem, and NPM is such a big ecosystem, and, and these are terribly important things for server-side JavaScript, that, uh, that those are things that need to be supported. It's not just enough to say we have an ECMAScript compliant engine. It's, it's gotta, we got to have these implementations done, right? And, uh, and that's what it's all about. Now, a big part of uh, the problem with, with Rhino is that its integration with, uh, with JavaScript and vice versa was really bad. And Nashorn kind of takes that to another level. Uh, sorry, of, not of bad, of good. <laughs> it, bring, it brings it back to good. <laughs> Gets it away from bad. <laughs> so there's there's this really high amount of, of interoperability with uh, with Java and JavaScript. Um, and so where are some benefits? So so this was a question that we just that, we, that was just asked. Uh, what is the benefit of of running from within the uh, the JVM to run JavaScript? And the answer to that is. Uh, Java has a long history of server-side development. It's, again, it's got 20 plus years of development. Um, there are also some really great parts to Java that, that make a lot of sense. They're, they're bad, of course, we all know the bad. Uh, everybody knows the bad, and, and those, are the, those are the things that are focused on. The good parts of Java, uh, Java has a really great modularity story, right? Java has always had a really great modularity story. Its ability to compose libraries, I think, is what brought it to more or less the forefront of enterprise development. Um, there, there's been a lot of problems solved 
uh, with respect to, to server-side development and with respect to web development from within the JVM. And uh, that's, that's really where the value is in, in, running, uh, in running JavaScript from within, from within Java, from within uh, the JVM. Um, so being able to effectively say that you, uh, you want to have uh, your, your code implemented in JavaScript, or whatever the right tool is, or within Java, and have complete interoperability between those two, uh, really makes a lot of sense so that you can leverage the entire JVM ecosystem, its libraries, all the stuff that, that, that makes Java great uh, from within your JavaScript code that you know is going to be so much better, right? So some things make sense to run in JavaScript, but we don't need to completely abandon everything that's gone along uh, from the past with, uh, with Java in order to get that benefit, right? So this is kind of a big deal. So let's talk about some of those things. What has Java done right? For better or worse, Java has gotten databases <laughs> down, down pat, right? Uh, the, the answer more or less within, um, it, it seems to me, the answer more or less within uh, Node applications is to uh, use something like Mongo, for example, where uh, a, a native JavaScript store, and that does make a lot of sense. JavaScript talking JavaScript, uh, that's, that's fantastic. But there are, there are going to be use cases where relational databases is, is, a, is a necessary thing. And having some sort of object-oriented programming model around your persistence is something that, that, that Java has pioneered and really done right, right? So ORMs on the JVM. Uh, that's a really great thing. Man, threads. Threads. We can't just ignore these things. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to say uh, threads are hard, which is, uh, I, I think, Node's answer. Threads are hard, so let's just not use them, right? Instead, you want to fork a process and, and have this complex IPC through libuv or something like that. Um, OK, that's not a great solution. Threads are a much better solution. And the JVM has gotten threads down, Pat. Uh, there's there's plenty of an invest technical investment in this side of things. They're very useful. We can leverage them, and, and and I'll show an example of being able to do that. And again, getting back to this idea, the right tool for the job, Java might not always be the right answer for you. Uh, likewise, uh, JavaScript may not always be the right answer for you. It may make sense for you to have some of your code implemented in Groovy or in Scala or in Java or in Clojure or JRuby or whatever it is that you want to have it implemented in. Um, Whatever makes sense for the job that for the problem that you're trying to solve, and the JVM is the platform that's capable of doing that. So uh, having all of these common, uh, uh, having a common place where all of these languages can run is a really important thing, um, and that makes it great. Now I'm going to skip embedded systems a little bit, but uh, uh, build systems. This is huge. Uh, Java build systems are are extremely advanced. They're very mature. Uh, Maven has, for better or worse. Uh, is a good build system. Uh, <laughs> Gradle is an awesome build system. Uh, SBT is a pretty good build system. Uh, Ant is even out there. I mean, uh, probably above all else, Ant is is a very powerful build system, right? And and these are growing. I mean, there's a ton of these all over the place. Uh, so being able to build complex projects and and uh, uh, put them together, there's a really big ecosystem of uh, uh, of build frameworks and and build tooling that's out there. So that's really great. So I want to just show you guys real quick some examples of uh, some of the some of the good parts that we've talked about here. And uh, with respect to the commits, uh, I'm actually going to jump around a little bit, and I'm going to just jump straight to this. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going to skip over uh, server-side scripting because I'm going to come back to that. But what I want to show you guys uh, very quickly here is having an interface, having some contract defined in Java, having an interface defined in Java, and then actually implementing that in JavaScript and being able to use that throughout the rest of your Java code base. Uh, that's a pretty powerful concept, what I just said. And this was something that we didn't have until Nazhorn uh, on the Java side. So if we destroy our project, which I did, Just can't get this thing right. Okay, so I have some class foo, right? And this is its interface. Can everyone see this okay? 
this is uh, this is enterprise advanced enterprise stuff here. <laughs> so the interface foo defines the contract of get message and it's going to return a string, right? We have no implementation of foo, but I have this main class, and we can ignore a little bit of the top part here. But uh, basically, what this main class is is going to do is we're going to uh, call out to this JavaScript and we're going to get back an implementation of foo. And then from within our JavaScript, we're going to use this typed object to, uh, to, to get the message and print it out. And the JavaScript side of this, so the IDs still haven't caught up with the uh, constructor syntax, so there's a little bit behind this. But effectively, what we're doing is we're making use of Nashorn's ability to define a Java type. We're extending that type uh, in, into our own typed object. And then we're, we're constructing it. And uh, through this uh, literal um, notation, we're, we're defining the function's implementation, right? So we're saying get message is this function. Uh, we're going to return OK out of this. So what I would expect to see here is it print out OK. And if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it works, right? So that's pretty cool. This is using the right tool for the job. Uh, in, in, this, in, in a more practical example, uh, JavaScript may be, the, may be the, uh, the, the best area to implement some object, right? That having the logic in, in JavaScript might make much more sense for you. Uh, being able to then take that implementation logic and kick it back as a typed object into your, into your uh, Java ecosystem, this comes with a lot of flexibility and power. Uh, so let's talk about threads. Let's talk about threads, because threads are important. OK, so now we get some threads. Uh, and basically what I'm doing here, so this is a little bit different from the last example. In the last example, we were looking at, uh, we were looking at taking and getting back an object from JavaScript, right? In this example, what we're looking at is doing, is utilizing something from the JVM ecosystem entirely in JavaScript. So here, for example, uh, I have a thread. I've extended my thread. This is my implementation. And within my, within my run here, what I'm saying is that I want you to thread.sleep. Java programmers understand this. You guys know this, right? Thread.sleep for two seconds. Uh, and I'm just saying I'm going to do it five times. I'm going to print it out. I'm going to start the thread, and then I'm going to join on the thread, which means we're going to wait for it to finish uh, before, uh, before continuing on. And, uh, and running this, we can see it gets us this, right? So now I have threads inside of my JavaScript code. That's pretty cool. That's, that's going to open the door for a lot of possibilities and capabilities, right? Uh, the, the caveat, of course, is that this is now pretty bound to Nashorn um, or Java implementation uh, at a minimum. So that, that can get us quite, quite a ways. Now, another thing that I want to show you guys is uh, is a little bit more of, of this capability. Now, maybe it makes sense in your application to have your code implemented in JavaScript or to have uh, some, some business logic that you have written in JavaScript. But at the same time, maybe some of the uh, functionality of JavaScript uh, isn't, isn't where you want it to be. So you want to make, you want to make use of, um, of, of some of Java's APIs. Uh, a really great example of this is Java 8's collection APIs come with uh, a lot of flexibility, a, a lot of new capabilities. Stream processing, for example, very functional style of, of working with uh, collections, and um, far superior to the way that JavaScript deals with it. And you can bring in the JavaScript library for doing that kind of stuff, but we don't need to, right? Not in the JVM anyway. When we're when we're running with the Nashorn, we can make use of these functional types. Uh, th these functional APIs to, uh, to to work with our list, right? And so in this case, what I've done is I've uh, I've, I've gotten a handle on an array list. Um, I have created a class that will uh, effectively uh, map to either a function or a consumer in Java eight terms. And uh, and what I'm using, what I'm doing here is I'm uh, within my within my JavaScript code. I'm making use of Java 8's uh, stream capabilities. To, uh, to map it and then uh, just do a simple for each over, over the list, right? So again, uh, implement it entirely within JavaScript. And if I run this thing, we would expect to see some of that 246 right, type stuff, right? And that's exactly what we see there. 
Uh, so this this is a this is a pretty cool thing because now we can sort of have this this dual mixed world where where we're using the best of breed from both sides. So why should I care, right? <laughs> This, this comes back to it. V8 seems fine. Uh, Node, Node's working well on the servers now. Everything's really great. Um, again, getting back to that idea of being able to use best of breed, that's, that's a pretty important one. Uh, you want to you wanna be able to use the right tool for the job uh, at the end of the day. M probably more important than this, though, is, is, uh, is spearheading a refactor, right? So if you have an existing enterprise application, an existing Java application, and maybe it's maybe it's a monolith, maybe not, um, but maybe it's something where you've said, uh, I, I want to move this application over to JavaScript. I want to I want to make a Node app out of this thing, but maybe there's not a very clear uh, way of getting there, right? Without so I I, I think at, as a general rule, we kind of have a tendency as developers to to just say, you know, screw it, I'm I'm going greenfield with this thing. I'm going to start from scratch. That's that's cool, right? But these these huge refactorings are, are costly, they're expensive. They, they come with risk, too. There's a ton of risk, right? And especially when you're working in, in, in a legacy code base that maybe doesn't have the best test coverage, or maybe there's been tribal knowledge that's gone into some of the domain logic. Uh, you, you can't just abandon that stuff, or you shouldn't abandon that stuff. If you're, if you're smart, you're not going to abandon it. Uh, but getting to the point where you can actually start to move some of your stuff into the far more superior language of JavaScript um, you can you can utilize something like Nashorn to kind of give you that bridge, right? So Nashorn is able to be embedded. Uh, it's able to uh, to run in an embedded context, which means that you don't need to totally throw away all that business logic that 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 has spent years and years being built up, and you can still have your your cake and eat it too, more or less, right? So that's kind of that's kind of the idea behind um, behind that approach to it. And then in addition to that. The, the JVM ecosystem, probably beyond all else, is just rich with tooling, right? And some of that tooling is designed for things like monitor, monitoring or, um, or instrumentation. Uh, New Relic is a great example of, of, uh, of this. You, you, can, you can get a lot of insight into the performance of your application, into things that are happening with your application through instrumentation. Um, there's, there's no reason to throw all that stuff away. Within your applications, you can still get all the benefits of this. Um, uh, just by running your JavaScript within Nashorn, right? So you're running it inside of this container, and that's that's the um, that's a far more superior approach, as an opinion. Uh, sorry, let me switch back to the. So I, I just briefly want to touch on this uh, server-side scripting um, uh, stuff. This is this is pretty important, uh, I think, because. Uh, um, JavaScript is cool. It makes a lot of sense. It's easy to work with. Um, you know, maybe some of the stuff that you're doing is pulling from some REST endpoint. And you need to process some JSON result out of that. That's really hard to do with uh, with with Bash. Has anyone ever tried that? I have. Uh, it's it's really hard to do. So you wind up going with something like Perl, right? And then you have two problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. Um, but uh, this JJS command is effectively what allows you to write these um, server-side scripts. You can run them. Um, you get some some uh, Bash-like syntax, or uh, sorry, Perl-like syntax out of it. So you can fall back to the shell. You can capture the output of it. You can process it accordingly, etc. So now you DevOps hipsters can write all of your uh, write all your code in um... <laughs> no. <laughs> Node app. Let me see. Oh, scripting. Okay, so I've written this thing. I've written a. a yeah, so I've written a, um, a script here, and basically what this script is designed to do is to uh, generate a leaderboard based off of Git info from a particular directory, right? So one of the things that you'll probably notice right away is that uh, using the, the uh, uh, scripting aspect of, of Nashorn's integration with the JVM, you, uh, you get some additional capabilities. So within your, within your JavaScript script, you get the capability of here docs so that you can write these multi-line uh, strings delimited by, by some finalizer. Um, so you can write this out. This is my usage, right, and it'll respect that. Uh, you still get all of your uh, interoperability with uh, with the Java APIs, right? So, so now we're able to script against Java APIs. That's a pretty cool thing. So this is quite literally JavaScript, 
Um, uh, you can pull off the arguments. You get some special syntax for getting the arguments out, et cetera. Uh, and we can we can uh, then go about uh, implementing the rest in, in our JavaScript syntax. Now the backtick, uh, you're able to uh, wrap uh, some string inside this backtick, and uh, and that will um, execute the command, right? Just like just like you would get with Perl. Uh, and then take that and do whatever you will with it. In this case, I've I've written some awesome untested JavaScript to uh, to uh, basically print something out really nice like this. Um, but, but effectively what this is demonstrating is being able to capture arguments, variable arguments to the script, uh, go off and, and do some work with them, uh, do some string interpolation based off of that, convert it over to actual Java types, proper Java types, and, uh, and go off and do some additional stuff with it. Now this, I feel like this would have been uh, 10 times as much code. It's 100 lines of code, and that's with, with blank lines in there as well. Uh, it probably would have been 10 times as much to do this just in regular Java. So if I run, oh, and you can also set the execution bit on it, which is nice. Now, one important thing to note, can everyone at the back see that? Maybe not. OK. One important thing to note is that as you're passing arguments, you need to do a double dash in advance. So I can take and I can say, I want to know the get info for Asgard. And we'll see it prints out some of the, uh, the leaderboard for deletes and, uh, and inserts, et cetera. It's just kind of a, a fun little toy, right? but basically showing that, that scripting capability on, on the server side. You can do very robust stuff with this, as you can imagine. OK, so let's talk performance real quick. Uh, here's here's kind of where it's at. Uh, from, from the standpoint of, of implementation, um, Java 8 brought Nashorn to, to, to the JVM, right? So we, we, we get now, at this point, we get practical JavaScript. And like I said before, the, uh, the, the focus and the emphasis was on compliance and performance. Uh, Nashorn, Nashorn is far more performant than Rhino. It is far less performant than V8 today. Um, so writing your Node app in, uh, with Nashorn is not going to perform as well as, as just running with regular Node right from the command line. Uh, so that, that aspect of it is not quite there yet. In, in the near term, though, uh, that is the immediate focus. So the engine is down. Now the focus is on tuning the performance and, and really getting the performance up to snuff. Um, so soon, today we're at Java 8 update 20. Uh, by Java 8 update 40, the idea here is that JavaScript will have native, native performance levels. So that's a pretty, pretty awesome thing. Then it will be a real competitor for, for V8 and, and other, uh, other server-side engines. So that's pretty cool. Uh, even more than that, Nashorn is not just a JavaScript engine. It, it happens to, to be the JavaScript engine today. But, but I think that what they figured out as they were going through and implementing Nashorn is that actually a lot of the work that they're doing is applicable to nearly every dynamic language. So a lot of the work that's gone into Nashorn and, and gone into getting this really nice JavaScript implementation on the JVM has come with uh, building out these dynamic linking libraries that are uh, that allow any dynamic language effectively to have the same level of Java interop. Um, so that's a pretty cool thing. Um, and I think that that will be more or less the future uh, of, of what Nashorn's value proposition is on the JVM. Uh, I know that um, uh, Charlie Nutter, uh, the uh, uh, JRuby uh, author, uh, he's looking at using Nashorn for uh, for doing uh, dynamic linking within Ruby. Um, we will probably see a time when Groovy has some uh, use for Nashorn, or at least its libraries. So I think that uh, a, a lot of good is coming out of this for the for the JVM as a dynamic language platform. And uh, and of course, uh, it'll continue as uh, uh, Java 8 matures and evolves. Uh, it'll continue to improve upon the performance. Of, uh, of JavaScript on the server side. Java 9 will probably come with some more significant improvements. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool, getting, getting near native performance out of a managed runtime environment. Uh, that's, that's got a lot, of, a lot of value, I think. Questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks? I've heard of a project called Vertex that it also lets you run 
JavaScript on the, on that JVM. Yeah. Is that a competitor to this, or how would you compare some of the feature differences? Yeah. So uh, the the question was, how do you compare um, Vertex? So it's uh, Vertex is a um, is an asynchronous web framework. Um, it it is capable of of uh, uh, integrating with any vertical. Uh, one of those happens to be uh, JavaScript. Um, Vertex will make use of this. Oh, okay. uh, I, I believe that it already is making use of this, um, but I, I don't know for sure. Some, okay. Somebody else with more familiarity. I may already be using this. It's very possible, yeah. <laughs> very, very possible. Any other questions? I think uh, that uh, the, the details around that are on the uh, Object Partners blog as well. Uh, I remember reading through that. Uh, I, I did something uh, very similar with uh, the Grails uh, JavaScript controllers plugin. So I, I wrote a plugin for Grails that would let you write your controllers in JavaScript uh, using either Nashorn or, or Rhino. Uh, and, and part of that meant uh, building a, a test runner for Spock where you could run Karma tests. Or uh, or whatever whatever your choice was. Uh, actually, I think I was using Jasmine. Uh, so a Jasmine test runner, uh, you could write some functional tests with Spock. Anyone else? So I saw you're using an MD to bring in the JavaScript. Is there uh, is there an API to kind of to use module.exports or use common JS sort of module at all? Or? Sure. Uh, I'm using a what? Uh, an if an if I I F uh, immediately immediately uh, Oh yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. So um, so the question was, uh, uh, it, it, is there some capability of using require to bring the module in? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Avatar uh, provides uh, Node APIs, so you can use require. So uh, as an example. library like using the uh, require syntax. Is this what you're getting at? Yeah. Well, in the Java code, though. Oh. Instead of actually having to execute uh, a function coming in from the Java. There's just a question. Yeah, actually, I, th I, I, I do believe that there is, but you, you have to use the node stuff. Um, okay. But uh, once you get a handle on the, uh, the script engine, Uh, yeah, uh, in, inside of the uh, the server that gets started up. So this this main class is invoking server. There's a um, there's a secure holder class that exposes that require. So you can do it that way. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, by default, I don't think that it's exposed. I think it's uh, protected or private. Um, but uh, actually, one of a, a different example that I have that I'll, I'll push up as well. Actually, uh, copy and paste that implementation, and I've, I've changed some of the access levels uh, to be able to get a handle on things like that. So I, I have an example I'll, I'll push up of uh, using uh, Spring Boot to back uh, a node app uh, and using Spring Data to talk to the database and stuff like that. Um, so it's an express app that's using Spring for all of the, the hard work. Um, and in that, I, it has a, a custom server implementation that, uh, so that I can get a handle on that. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.